Pandeham Shiguro Shiyutapade Kamalam Shigurun Vaishnavam Sha Sirupam Sagujatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitam Sha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinabandu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namos Tute Tapta Kanchana Godangi Radhe Brindavane Suri Vishavanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpa Tarubischa Kripa Sindhu Vaibhaja Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutta Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamene Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvishesha Shunyavari Pastyatya De Sitarine Shri Krishna Chaitana Prabhunathananda Shri Advaita Gadar Har Sivasari Ghar Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Okay, so this is the concluding day, and we'll continue to churn some of the pastimes in the Mahabhar. As we were saying, the Mahabhar is that scripture that teaches uh, a lot about uh, life, how to live life. It's hardcore. It gets right to the essence. There's a lot of intrigue. There's a lot of uh, cheating, lying, stealing, wars killing, romance, it gets right into everything. Great, There's great sages, there's great demons. And there's all kinds of aspects in the Mahabhar. Maha means great, and Bhart refers to that king that once ruled India called King Bhart. Mahabhart means the great, the Maha, great Bhart means the, you know that great tract of land ruled by uh, King Bhart, and that refers to the Bhart who was the son of Rishabdev. There are three Bharts. There was one of Shab, son of Rishabdev. There's another Bhart who is actually the brother of Lord Ramchandra, and there's one more, also. So all of them are three great personalities, but this is one is the son of Rishabdev. So this Mahabharata is history. It, uh, it stories. What makes Mahabharata important is that it, Krishna is in, in there. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just, you know, like many, many other great literatures, but what makes it actually superb or special or instructive, necessary to understand is that the presence of Krishna. <laughs> and Vyasadeva made it even more so by putting the whole Bhagavad Gita right in the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata is called the fifth Veda. There are four Vedas. There's the Yajur Veda, the Sama Veda, the Rig Veda, and the Atharva Veda. Veda was normally one, but uh, Vyasadeva decided to divide it accordingly and divided into four categories of itself. And each one has a specific focus in transcendental knowledge. But then again, he created the fifth Veda. The fifth Veda is the Ramayan, the Mahabharata, and the Ithihastas. The Ithihastas are the histories. And that is said that's for people in Kali Yuga, because most people can't understand the Vedas, nor will they even read the Vedas or even take interest in the Vedas. But people like stories, they like adventure, they like romance, they like conflict. So he called that the fifth Veda. That way people actually uh, are reading a Veda, although it's uh, given by Veda Vyas himself, who was an incarnation, Shaktivation, incarnation of the Lord, who was empowered to write down the Vedic knowledge after the beginning of Kali Yuga, because people could not remember uh, as they used to be. Of course, in this age of Kali, we understand four things become 
what we say, uh, decreased. Uh, longevity of life becomes less. Intelligence becomes less. Bodily strength becomes less. And mercifulness becomes less in this age. And so memory is also becomes less. So people cannot remember. And so, therefore, the liter Vedic literatures now, they use the Vedic literatures are called Shruti. Shruti means that you learn it by hearing it, hearing it. And it was spoken from the guru to the disciple. And therefore, the essence of the Vedas are the Upanishads. Upanishad means, Upanishad means to sit down near. And it begs the question, sit down near what? Who? Sit down near the guru and receive transcendental knowledge. So there's 108 Upanishads where there are uh, 12 primary Upanishads. Of course, Prabhupada gave us Sri Isho Upanishad out of all the Upanishads. Of course, we have Ketha, Kanta, Ketha Upanishads and uh, Katha Upanishads, Kena Upanishads, Katha Upanishads. Uh, the, uh, um, there are many other Upanishads that are prominent, that are important. They are Shruti, they are the Vedas themselves. Mahabharata is like history, and uh, it's called the Fifth Vedas, but still it has many relevant things that the Vedas propound and explain, explain in language that people cannot understand or decipher or understand how to apply. So therefore we learn a lot from Mahabharata. And one of the things we can learn is a lot of things is what not to do. <laughs> It's a good scripture that teaches what to avoid in terms of how to live life. <laughs> um, we have one of the main principles or main stories in Mahabharata or main topics is the, uh, the great war between the Kurus and the Pandavas, both members of the same family, and uh, how that war played itself out and the role that Krishna played and actually bringing the Pandavas, who were his pure devotees, to the to the position of rulers of the entire world, headed by King Yudhisthira. But because this is the material world, one of the most uh, prominent disqualities that the living entity carries around is envy. And so although the Pandavas were rightful heirs to the throne, their cousin brother, uh, Deodhana and his father, Dhritarashtra, were envious of the Pandavas, and, and Dhritarashtra wanted his sons to rule, and his sons wanted to rule more than he actually wanted them to rule. Because Kshatriyas, they look for opportunities to rule. A Kshatriya without a kingdom is a person who is somewhat, it's like a person without any direction in life. <laughs> So now Duryodhana, he's the son of, uh, of uh, Dhritarashtra. And Dhritarashtra was actually supposed to inherit the throne, but because of the blindness, he was unable to take the throne. And therefore Pandu was supposed to take the throne, but Pandu was also cursed to die if he had uh, union with a woman because he had killed one deer who was having union with a she deer and that deer was actually a, a sage who had transformed himself into a deer so they could have uh, sexual licenses in the forest. When that deer was dying he said because I am dying now um, you will also die the next time you have any relationships with a woman. Pandu Fondal followed that, but one time he got very, very lusty, and he went after his wife, Madri. And because of that, he died immediately because of the curse. And now there was nobody to rule the throne. And then there was a contention. Vidura could not rule the throne. He was the other brother. And we, because Vidura was born of a maidservant, therefore his... His heritage was mixed Kshatriya and Sudra. 
although he was the son of Vyasadeva, he was still the daughter, the son of a maidservant, and therefore he couldn't take the throne either. So now it had to go to the oldest son, which was Yudhisthira. But Doryodhana became envious, and therefore they were cousins, cousin brothers, because they all had, there was three brothers, they were all sons of these three brothers, two brothers mostly, and therefore they were fighting amongst themselves, others, for each other for the throne. And Duryodhana did everything he could to somehow or other cause harassment to the Pandavas. When the Pandavas were in the pirates for uh, 13 years, they were living, and Draupadi had also gone into the forest. Now one day, one great saint, his name was Durasamuni, not a saint, he's more like a sage. He's an expansion of Lord Shiva. He's a mystic yogi, very powerful. But he has one outstanding characteristic. He gets angry very easy. So he came to visit Deodhana. Deodhana understood who he was and understood that if, if I can get the favor of, of Durvasa, then I can use him against the Pandavas. So Devasa stayed with Deodhana. Deodhana served him nicely. But to serve Devasa was very difficult because Devasa would sometimes say, well, I'm hungry in the middle of the night. And then he would call for food. And right in the middle of the night, they would bring the food. And he would say, what is this? Is not This is not suitable for anything. And then he wouldn't eat it. Or sometimes they would bring him something to eat. And he'd say, I'm fasting today. Or other times he would say, all of a sudden, cook me a big feast. And he had 10,000 followers. So they all came with Durvasa to the palace of Diodana. But Diodana, although he was such a, what we say, a, you know, he had many bad qualities, he somehow or other tolerated whatever Durvasa did because he was trying to get Durvasa's favor. So Devasa was actually just testing Duryodhana to see how much he could tolerate. And then when he saw that Duryodhana had passed all the tests he threw in front of him, he said to Duryodhana, you know, you know, I, uh, I can see you're a very special person. I've come. I've given you much trouble. Still, you acted as the perfect host. Therefore, I offer you three benedictions. So just ask for whatever you want. Now, Duryodhana is smiling. Karna is also there because they knew if they could get Durvasa to harass the Pandavas, this would be to their advantage. So Duryodhana said, well, my dear sage, I do have only one request. And uh, it's not a very difficult request. The Pandavas are living in the forest with Draupati. And I want you to go there along with your 10,000 disciples and ask for something to eat after all of them have finished their meals. After the Pandavas, the Brahmanas, and especially Draupati, when they all finish their meals, I want you to arrive and ask for food. The Rasa said, is that all? Yes, okay. And so now he takes his 10,000 men and travels to the forest. They locate the Pandavas. What had happened, Draupadi had a special pot that was given to her by Surya, the sun god. That pot had a certain mystical quality to it. And what was that quality? That it could produce unlimited amounts of food as long as Draupadi hadn't eaten. So, uh, therefore, even in the forest, she could feed like hundreds and hundreds of Brahmanas who would come for lunch, sages and others. And everybody had nice meals. Whatever she would cook, it was unlimited. And so, but once she took her food, and she was always the last of uh, then, that was it. There would be no more. No one else could come after that. So the rasa arrives right after Draupadi has finished eating. 
and there's nothing left. The Rasa comes and he says, oh, I'm here with my sages, my, uh, with my uh, followers. Please arrange some meals for us. We will go down to the banks of the Ganga, uh, not the Ganga, we will go banks down to the banks of the river and take bath. And then when we return, please have some foodstuffs for us. So Draupadi, Bhima welcomes him, Yudhisthira welcomes him. Now they all turn to Draupadi. What are we going to do? Draupadi said, well, I don't know because <laughs> I've taken food and there's nothing left. There's just an empty pot. So what do devotees do when they get in trouble? What do devotees do when they become complex, com uh, perplexed? Or what do devotees do all the time? They depend on Krishna. They pray to Krishna. They call out for Krishna, especially in desperate situations. Uh, a devotee knows that by the mercy of Krishna, all problems become easily solved. And Srila Prabhupada spoke in one lecture, and later on it was transcribed, that he said, if you remember the lotus feet of Krishna, whenever you remember the lotus feet of Krishna, you should know you will never be impeded in your devotional service. Now, the lotus feet of Krishna means to bring the presence of Krishna. And by bringing Krishna's presence, everything becomes auspicious. And so for a devotee, that's their uh, success in Krishna consciousness. They depend on Krishna. It takes faith to always depend on Krishna. Because some of us, because we may have some great intelligence or great abilities or have some successes in our lives, a lot of times we depend on our own qualities, capabilities, past experiences, intelligence, whatever, in order to carry out some situation or even to overcome some problems and difficulties. But that always falls short. May Sometime it may work, but most of the time it doesn't. So a devotee has faith in Krishna. Depends. And Krishna comes according to how much faith you have. If you have 50% faith, Krishna is there 50%. If you have 70% faith, Krishna reciprocates accordingly. If you have complete faith in Krishna, then he's always with you. And all you have to do is remember him. And he is complete, he's there to assist the devotee in whatever the devotee needs in their devotional service. Or even in practical things, Krishna will help the devotee. He gives the intelligence. Give you an example. Just this morning, I had forgotten, or not forgotten, I had, uh, I had uh, misunderstood the actual beginning of this seminar time. I was thinking 945, because the number 45 kept coming into my mind. And I was realizing that was the other lectures. So I'm thinking 945 will be the beginning. And so I pick up my beads I start chanting, waiting for 9.45, it's 9.25, and I'm chanting, and all of a sudden, Krishna says, check the schedule. <laughs> so, I go to check the schedule, it says 9.30. Whoa, I got to run down, set up the computer. So, if I wasn't chanting Japa, I wouldn't have been able to remember that. That's a fact. So, as soon as we remember Krishna or a call out to Krishna, everything becomes clear. So Draupadi, she's, now she's thinking what to do. She knows there's only one solution. She starts praying. Not only praying, but calling from the core of her heart because they all know if the rasa, the rasa becomes angry, eh, there's no chance that they'll have anything auspicious. He may curse them. He may even cause them to die. So the Rasa, he gets quite angry. I mean, he's he's a he's an energy of Lord Shiva and gets angry very very easily. And so they're afraid of offending this this sage. 
So she's calling to Krishna. Not only is she calling to Krishna, she's remembering Krishna in her mind and heart. She's seeing Krishna in her mind. She's glorifying Krishna's qualities, his transcendental form, his beautiful lotus-like face. She's seeing Krishna in her heart and in her mind. And as she's doing that, she's gra gradually describing all the beautiful qualities of Krishna in her prayers. Finally, Krishna appears in person. And he says, I'm hungry. Give me something to eat. <laughs> Draupadi says, well, I, you know, uh, there's nothing to eat. Uh, and then she explains the situation. Krishna says, just bring the pot. Let's see. So... She brings the pot, and on the rim of the pot, there was a little bit of rice and vegetables stuck there. So Krishna takes this rice and vegetable, one little speck, and he eats it. And he becomes completely satisfied, because Krishna is satisfied by bhakti, not so much by anything else. Whatever we offer to Krishna, it's the bhakti that, that makes the offering complete. We have to offer something, and therefore we have we have principles on how to offer different things to Krishna: food, our time, our energy, our intelligence, our abilities, our resources, whatever we have, we offer. But you know, sometimes people think it's what we offer that makes Krishna happy. Not no, not actually. What makes Krishna happy and pleased is how you offer it. What is the mood? And therefore, when Krishna is satisfied by that mood of, of devotion, everything becomes auspicious. So, simply by tasting that little bit of rice from Draupadi's cooking, uh, the Lord became satisfied. Bhima, now, he runs down to the, to the bank of the, the uh, river to call the sages, come, for Prashad. Now, all of a sudden, the sages who are followers of Devasa Muni, they're feeling completely full. So they look at that each other, and everyone is thinking, I'm not hungry. Are you? No, I'm not hungry either. I'm feeling full. So uh, they turn to Devasa and say, Devasa, you know, none of us are feeling hungry. What are we going to do? Devasa said, Let's go before they come. So Devasa and his men depart, and the Pandavas are freed from uh, the reactions that Devasa would naturally give. So Dorya Dons, what we say, uh, plan to foil the Pandavas uh, was uh, what was was foiled itself. Was foiled itself. We see also, we also mention how Krishna said, I'm not going to fight. But when Bhishma Dev was fighting with Arjuna, really fighting with Arjuna, wanting to finish Arjuna and the five Pandavas, Krishna knew if he didn't do anything, the Pandavas were going to be finished. Therefore, after Arjuna's chariot was smashed and the broken chariot was laying on the on the uh, battlefield, Krishna grabs the wheel, picks up the wheel, and starts charging towards Bhishma Dev in great anger. Of course, Bhishma Dev is very hangry, happy to see that, seeing Krishna come up, come towards him in that mood. He was thinking, "This is the best of all things that can happen in my life. Krishna is coming to fight with me, because he has a chivalrous rasa with Krishna." And so, but Krishna did that, he broke his promise. Sometimes people say, well, you know, we like to worship Ram because whatever Ram says, he does. He's so righteous, he's moral, he follows principles, he never deviates from his word, he's ideal. But Krishna, you know, he says, I'm not going to fight, and he fights. And he says to the gopis, uh, after he left Vrindavan, I'll be back. But he doesn't come back. <laughs> At least for, for, for 90 years he stayed away. So, sometimes people say, well, you know, how can Krishna be God 
because he says one thing and he does something else. But he is the God of all gods. He is Ishwara Parma Krishna. He's the highest manifestation of the absolute truth because he works according to the principles of bhakti. And when his devotees are in trouble, he considered that more important than his reputation. He's willing to have his reputation, what we say, criticized in order to save his devotees. That's Krishna. So how much Krishna loves his devotees and how much the devotees adhere to Krishna in devotional service is really a beautiful like, un understanding of the principle of bhakti. Uh, as when Darvasa Muni had committed an offense against uh, Maharaj Ambarish, and uh, Krishna, Maharaj Ambarish had prayed to uh, the Lord to save him, the Lord threw his chakra to kill uh, this fiery demon that had been created by Durvasa Moon in order to destroy um, uh, Maharaj Ambarish. And then the chakra came running after Durvasa. Durvasa is fast, and he fled. He fled first to uh, first. He fled to Shiva Loka. Shiva said, "I'm sorry. It's Vishnu's chakra. There's nothing I can do." Then he left and went to Brahma Loka. Brahma told him the same thing. If you want to get free from him, you got to go see Vishnu. Finally, he comes to the Vaikuntha, outskirts of Vaikuntha, and he meets the Supreme Lord in his four-handed form as Lord Vishnu. He falls at the Lord's feet begging for, the, for his chakra to stop. The Lord said, I have no power to stop my chakra. It's not in my hands. And then he quoted that famous verse, the devotees of the Lord are in my heart and I am in the heart of my pure devotees. My devotees know no one but me and I know no one but my devotees. So he said, if you want to be free from my chakra, you have to fall at the feet of my pure devotee, Maharaj Ambarish. If he forgives you, only then can my chakra stop. <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's the loving relationship between Krishna and his devotees. And Krishna will even break his promise in order to fulfill the desires of his devotees by protecting him in difficult situations. Kunti aprati jani hi me bhakta pranashyati. Declare it boldly, R. Arjun. Krishna doesn't say, well, I'll, I'll say it. He says it, but then he says, you say it, because if you say it, then people will believe you. Because when I say it, people don't believe me. <laughs> Krishna says that. So sometimes <laughs> he, he wants his devotees to vouch for his for his uh, love for his devotees. So that's how Krishna does things. And therefore Arjun was protected. The Pandavas were always protected by Krishna. How many times did Duryodhana try to destroy the Pandavas? He put them in a house of lack <clears throat> and, you know, was about to burn, set fire to the house. You know, Krishna arranged for uh, Vidura to come and warn the Pandavas that this was going to be, what was going to happen. And they dug a tunnel underneath and they had escaped fire. And so the poison cake that was given to Bhima, so, so many situations, Rakshastras in the jungles. Krishna always arranged somehow to protect the Pandavas from being harmed. And that's Krishna's uh, love for his devotees. So we even see now we're in, devotees are in a difficult situation with this, this spread of this pestilence all over the world. Are the devotees protected? Well, then we might say, well, we see how some devotees have succumbed to this. The thing is, God protects those who take shelter of him and protect themselves. So in other words, when we make an effort, Krishna makes up the difference. If we don't make the effort, then we can't expect everything to work out accordingly. So devotees have to do everything they can to do whatever they want to accomplish but they depend on Krishna. 
And when there's nothing else to do in to save the situation, then the devotees say call out to Krishna with from their heart. And when Krishna when they call out from Krishna with their heart, the, the Lord hears and responds. And in some way or other, he protects his devotees. And we have like hundreds and hundreds of stories in our ISKCON movement. I'm sure each and every one of you can remember some stories of how the Lord protected his devotees in difficult situations. That is Krishna. So it takes faith, but it also takes that, um, that determination to take shelter of Krishna in each and every situation. And sometimes we see people like to take shelter of God when there is some danger. But Prabhupada said, it's always dangerous. This is the nature of the material world. Padam padam ya vi padam te sham. That at any time, something could happen and the whole situation becomes a life-threatening situation. So Krishna is always there. But we have to take shelter and call for Krishna sincerely. Just like Draupadi, when Draupadi was in the assembly of the Kurus, you know, <clears throat> the Pandavas couldn't do anything to save their own wife. They had been uh, relegated to practically inaction. Bhima was getting quite angry, but he couldn't do anything. No one could do anything at the time. And then when they had bet Draupadi, <laughs> Yudhisthir had bet Draupadi in the, in the gambling match, and she was lost. And now the first thing that the Dusha, Dushashana, which is the brother of Doryadon, one of the leading sons of Dhritarashtra, he wanted to, uh, as Prabhupada see, uh, see naked beauty. So he grabs her uh, sari and starts pulling it and pulling it and pulling it and pulling it. Now, what is her, her chance of resisting? against this big powerful Kshatriya. So her sari is coming off and she's grabbing with one hand, holding her sari. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> finally she realizes she has to call out to Krishna. And she calls out to Krishna with one hand on her sari and the other hand in the air. Krishna's in Dwarka. He's playing dice with Rukmini. Rukmini understands the situation. She says, Krishna, you're your devotee's calling from you. Krishna says, no, let's play another game of dice. She's still holding on with one hand. <laughs> so when finally she let both hands go and threw her arms up into the air and realized, it's only you who can save me. And so when that happened, then Krishna came and he incarnated as in unlimited sari. And as Dushashana will continue to pull. All there was was a huge pile of sari in the middle of the, the palace floor. And finally they gave up because there was no limit to the sari. So it wasn't until she fully surrendered that actually Krishna came to save her. And so you might also understand this point. Sometimes we don't, we still are hanging on to our own we should use our intelligence, or ability, or whatever we have to execute devotional service. But can we save ourselves from death? Can we save ourselves from this coronavirus? Can we save ourselves? No, we have to call out for Krishna for his protection and for his mercy. Only then are we completely protected and safe by his mercy. It's a matter of the heart being completely tuned to Krishna. Please, Krishna, save me. <laughs> or do something to save this situation. And especially in Kali Yuga now. You know, this Kali Yuga is becoming more and more dangerous to live in this place. <laughs> Prabhupada said the material world is always dangerous. It's just the nature of the material world. But now when it becomes even more dangerous, then people become more alert on how to somehow or other survive. But all of our arrangements always fall short until we simply call out to Krishna, depend on Krishna. And sometimes Krishna 
he protects his devotees by giving them the intelligence how to do things. He works through the through the consciousness of the devotee and enlightens the devotee on how to act in each and every situation. I can think of one story where two devotees were preaching in 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 uh, Pakistan. Well, actually, it wasn't Pakistan at the time; it was uh, East Bengal, and. Uh, they had, uh, this was during the war in 1972, two leading sannyasis were there and they were preaching. And uh, it was becoming dangerous. So people were saying, you should leave the country. So they decided, all right, Prabhupada was worried. Prabhupada was sending letters. There was no response. The mail was, got, it was getting cut off because of the war. And so Prabhupada was praying for them, obviously. So the the the, uh, uh, the army was allowing people to to leave the country, but no Hindu could leave, because if they found any Hindu leaving, they would just take them and kill them immediately. This was the war in in East Bengal. So there were two devotees. They get on the bus. They're trying to get the bus is trying to leave the country. They get stopped at the border. The army comes, checks on the bus, finds two sadhus, takes them off the bus, puts them up in front of the firing squad. Now they're going to shoot these two sannyasis. So one of them, one was Brahmananda, and I think the other one was uh, Pushta Krishna, or it was Gargamuni. I'm not sure, either one of the two. And uh, Brahmananda. They have their beads with them. So Brahmananda holds up his beads and starts chanting really loud. And he turns to the other devotee and says, Hey, we're going back to Godhead. Let's chant. So they start really chanting loud as they could. As they were chanting really loud, the whole and the Islamic army became bewildered. And the head general came up to them and said, All right, get on the bus and get out of here. Don't come back. <laughs> So that's a that's a that's a famous story that was told by the devotees. So you see, you know, this is an example of its extreme difficulty when how Krishna takes uh, takes care of his devotees when the devotees feelingly call out to Krishna for mercy. So this is the main point that we want to somehow or other uh, send across: is that uh, Krishna says. <clears throat> Uh, in all cases, just depend on me. <laughs> if you want to be successful in life, especially in devotional service, just depend on me. Always remember me. Jet my glories. Think of me. And make your life centered around Krishna. But see, we can't remember Krishna unless we make Krishna the most important thing in our life. If something else is important in our life, then it becomes that becomes the thing we remember more. So it's important that the devotees understand this principle. Krishna has to be the most important person. And he is because there's nobody second. If you become Krishna conscious, Yasmin Vigyanta Sarva Eva Vigyanta Bhavanti, if you know Krishna, you know everything. And if you know everything and you don't know Krishna, Shrama Eva Hikevalo, which means it's all a useless waste of time. Okay, so the Pandavas had that faith that no matter whatever situation they were in, they depended on Krishna. And Krishna saved them constantly, time after time, episode after episode, situation after situation. He was always there to make the difference and finally, the Pandavas became victorious. Yudhisthira ascended to the throne. And the Pandavas eventually took charge of ruling the entire world. Okay, it's all by the grace of the Lord. So we'll stop there and see if there's any questions that devotees may have.
Hmm. I've never heard that statement anywhere that the, the Vedas are books of knowledge, but usually can only be understood who is actually have Brahminical qualities. Therefore, we have what is called the uh, the uh, Shmitis. The Shrutis are the Vedas. The Shmitis are the commentaries on the Vedas. Bhagavad Gita is Shmiti. So we can read and understand Bhagavad Gita with the guidance of a spiritual master, of course. So it, this Varna thing is really doesn't apply so much because there is no, no one's born Brahman in this world anymore, especially in Kali Yuga. No one's born Kshatriyas, no one's born Vaishya. The scriptures, scriptures say, Kalo Sudra Sambhavan, that everyone in this age is born Sudra. And people can develop certain characteristics and qualities to bring themselves to a particular Varna according to education and training and guidance by superior authorities. But we don't have to worry about Varnas and ashrams like that. But we don't really, you know, study the Shrutis so much. We get everything through the spiritual masters. So most of our knowledge is coming through Puranas, Itihasras, uh, and Shmitis, which are commentaries on the Shrutis, like that. So mostly the Shrutis are cannot, cannot be understood only by the very highly qualified Brahmanas like that. Uh, generally, the Mahabhar, it's not necessary for Grihastas, but it says that people who are more interested or more inclined to hear spiritual messages through stories. This is why Vyasadeva put the Bhagavad Gita in the Mahabharat, because Mahabharat is all about different stories of different personalities. So generally, the Brahmins, they study the Shutris, and of course in our Krishna consciousness we study Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the Amalam Puranam, the pure. So we don't follow any of these Varna considerations like that, or even ashram considerations. We follow the teachings of the spiritual master. So Prabhupada has given us, you know, the books that we need to learn to study. And it grihe taco, bone taco, sabdahari boli taco. Whether you're Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, Grihastha, Brahmachari, Sanyasa, or Vanapras, it doesn't matter. If you're engaged in devotional service, these different ashrams and occupations are simply material. Van ashram is material. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was discussing with Ramananda Roy, he asked Ramananda, Ramananda Roy, what is the goal of devotional service? What is the goal of all knowledge? The first thing he said, Vanashramacharyata Pudushem Param Param Vishnu Aradi Panta Nanu Soshantikant. I can't remember the last line. But the point was that he quoted Vanashram as being the goal. And, Krish and Lord Chaitanya said, Iho Bhaje. That's external. Give me something more. <laughs> and then he said, Yat Karosi, Yat Anasi, Yat Didosi, Dadasi, Yat Yatapasi. Lord said, that's also nice, but give me, that's also external. Then he said, Sarva Dharma Pariksha Jamami Kamara. He said, well, that's very nice, but isn't there anything more? <laughs> so finally, when he came to this one verse, it's saying that one who worships the Lord and hears the quality Lord, no matter what material positions he is, he he can become fixed on the path to, back home, back to Godhead. So hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, it doesn't matter 
you know, grihe taco, bande taco, sub, whatever you are, whatever position you are, you're brahmana, shatriva, you know, you're grihasta, brahmachari, just hear and chant the glories of the Lord, like that. Of course, the Mahabhar is generally understood for people who cannot approach the higher scriptures because of the lack of ability and knowledge. And so they find they get spiritual knowledge, at least in uh, a very hardcore way, <laughs> through, through the lives of uh, saints and sages and kings in the Mahabhar. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> hmm. Well, <coughs> recognizing it. If you're feeling happy when someone else is happy, and when you're feeling sad when someone else is sad, that means you're not envious. Uh, in other words, when someone else's unhappiness makes you happy, then, or someone else's happiness makes you unhappy, or someone else's unhappiness makes you happy, then you're in a dangerous position. <laughs> so envy means basically... Um, I want what someone else wants, or I want to be honored like that other person who's being honored. In other words, I want what another person has, and I don't even want them to have it. I can't even see why they deserve it. Jealousy means I feel bad about my own self because I want it and I can't get it. So envy and jealousy are basically almost the same. So... Envy is the original sin, as Prabhupada describes. When the living entity falls from the spiritual world, they fall out of enviousness of the Supreme Lord. And they carry that anartha with them in this material world, and everyone is envious of everyone else. The whole world is like that. You know, when we see someone else getting more credit than us, or more favors than us better prashadam than us, <laughs> you know, something. And we feel unhappy about that. In the spiritual world, there's also envy, but it's not, it's spiritual envy, is that when someone is doing good and they get favored by Krishna and get recognized by Krishna, the other gopis or the other residents say, wow, look what they did. They did such nice things. They got recognized by Krishna. I'm going to do something even better to get recognized by Krishna. So they compete to somehow or other serve Krishna in a better way. It's not envy because it's actually they all feel happy serving Krishna. And whoever wins, whoever does the best service or the most pleasing service, then the other, all, everyone feels happy. But there's a competition. So in this world, competition is there everywhere but it's more like to destroy your opponent. That's envy. Uh, Prabhupada also says, a killing of animals, that's envy. The animal has been given a right to life by God. I interfere with that animal's, animal's right to life. I become envious of that living entity and I decide to destroy it. So envy is there. So how do we get over envy? We can develop certain mindsets, and that will help. But, and I'll mention those mindsets, but going back, really how we get over envy is to serve in a humble way. By serving the Vaishnavas, by running, by offering menial service to the devotees, we can get over this principle of envy. And another thing is that if we can understand that, that, uh, Whatever people have in this world is given to them by God. So why should anyone uh, feel bad about what another person has achieved by the grace of God? Because no one can achieve anything without the great grace of God. So therefore, when someone is envious towards another person, 
it really reflects their relationship with, with the Lord. Because they're basically saying, my dear Lord, you have made this person like that, and therefore, I don't think you should have did that. <laughs> so your problem is with Krishna. So whatever everyone has, it's the arrangement of the Lord. So in one of the qualities that we can develop to help overcome is to realize how much, how grateful we should be because Krishna has given us so much. If you're always looking to see what you have in terms of how much Krishna has given you in your life and thanking Krishna for that, you'll be happy, you'll be satisfied. So satisfaction in whoever you are or whatever you are is a principle of a peaceful mind and it's a quality of non-envious. It doesn't mean we don't try to increase knowledge, increase our service, increase our abilities. We can try that, but we understand that whatever comes by the way, the grace of the Lord, I can be satisfied with that. So one should never look outward and think, oh, I'll be happy if I can get that. I'll be happy if I can do that. I can, I'll be happy if I get... No, when we start thinking like that, then we become envious of other people or other situations. If, and, if, and if two people have the same uh, occupation in life, then our, our enviousness becomes more likely to occur. Because if someone, one of them is better in that occupation, the other one feels unhappy about that. Or maybe even tries to destroy it. Like, uh, I remember I was hearing one story where it was, uh, this was written by Gorgo Paul in his book. One man was working in an office and he was really good at his job. And he was excelling at his job. But the other co-workers started to feel envious of him. So sometimes when he would leave the office, they would go in there and steal one of his files or do something to his computer. In other words, they would try to sabotage you know, his work because they were envious that he was way beyond their, them in, in doing the same work that they were doing. And he was getting recognition. He was getting a lot more uh, opportunities for advancement. He was getting bigger pay. So we see that in the material world, you know, people become unhappy when someone else who has the same activity. So learn to be satisfied and in devotional circles, just serve the devotees. If you don't serve the devotees, then it'll be difficult for you to get over that enviousness. We can, we should not think, well, I have my service, that's all I need to do, no. You should think of ways to serve the Vaishnavas. And that way that helps us to become what we say peaceful and we develop nice relationships with other devotees. It's all based on humble service. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Well, there's many things you can do. Um, was, well, fortunately, the media is still available. So we can uh, get on the media and uh, have little group discussions with other devotees, like have a Srimad Bhagavatam discussion session and or any scripture that, you know, any one of our Vaishnava scriptures and share Krishna consciousness together. Um, if we're at our homes, where use many times our family members are also, also devotees, we should also take time to develop better relationships with our family members who are also devotees. Uh, we can give prasadam to others. 
we can give some donation to support some uh, some projects outside, like there are devotees now who are doing food distribution in different places around the world. And in order to do that, they have to raise funds, and then they're going out to feed people who are need, who need food. So it's a matter of just looking around and see what's available and think, how, how can I serve in this way or that way? If you want to serve, Krishna will give you some intelligence. Hare Krishna. Arriba, Mother Anjali. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Parasaram is the ideal person who sacrifices everything to give Krishna consciousness to others. Hare Krishna. Uh, well, Krishna says, Yat karosi yaranasi yaradadadosi tapasya yat kurusha manarpanam. He says, All that you do, all that you offer and give away, uh, all that you eat, all, that, all sacrifices you perform should be done as an offering to me. So, because you are a devotee, you are dedicating your life to service of Krishna. So don't separate the day-to-day -day duties that you have to do to family or to, you know, to the home or whatever from your life as something extra or material. Just do everything as a service to Krishna. And that means you offer the results to Krishna. Try to remember Krishna and... Uh, you know, pray to Krishna how best you can serve in these different situations. If we are remembering Krishna and serving Krishna in whatever we do, then it's fine. Even if it appears to be ordinary day-to-day -day things, even taking care of our own body, we have to understand that our body is really ultimately coming from Krishna. It comes through our parents, but it's actually Krishna's energy. So in, one, in the real sense, it belongs to Krishna. So when we take care of our body nicely, and so we can serve nicely, we're taking care of Krishna's property. And that's devotional service also. Why do we take rest at night? Because we need, we need to rejuvenate our body so we can serve nicely when we wake up. 
So we should think, well, I'm taking rest, so I need so much rest in order to serve nicely. But the goal is always how to serve. It's not so much the activity doesn't become an end in itself. It becomes a means where we can uh, support all of our devotional activities, no matter what they are. So try not to make that division between uh, one type of activity and another. Do everything in the mood of service. And that, take, that takes a little practice. When you start practicing it, you'll see how naturally it, it becomes. Hare Krishna. Anything else? Hi, Krishna Maharaj. This is Amrita. Um, um, I just want to understand how can we get Nilay Gauru's Kripa? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Lord Chaitanya says, I give my full mercy to a devotee who does two things chants the holy names of the Lord and doesn't find fault with other devotees. If you do these two things, you'll get the full mercy, full kripa of Gornetai. Haribo. <laughs> Um, well, the names of the Lord are full of his qualities. When you say Krishna, means Krishna means all attractive. When you say Hari, you say one who, one who takes away everything, material. Uh, so all of the names of the Lord refers to his qualities, his pastimes, or his devotees. So they are also full with meaning. Also, they include other aspects. It's not just a name, like we have a name, and that name in indicates us. But Krishna's names are full of meaning, like that. When you say, just like, let me say, when you say, Govinda. So Govinda means one who protects the cows, the land, and the senses or gives pleasure to the cows, the lands, and the senses. So when you're saying, you call Krishna Govinda, you're including all these meanings of the word Govinda in the name. Gopinath means one who gives, well, who's the lord of the gopis. So that means that not only one gopi, but unlimited gopis. He's the lord of unlimited gopis. So it's you're mentioning his qualities along with indicating his names like that. And we said sometimes we say Sri, Sri Krishna. Sri means beauty, like that. Or Bhagavan Sri Krishna. Bhagavan means one who's full in all six opulences. So if you want to make it more, uh, what we say. Uh, you know, definitive, you can say, you know, Bhagavan Shri Krishna. You can, instead of saying Mahaprabhu, you can say Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
Uh, instead of saying Nityananda, you can say Nityananda Ram. <laughs> so, I mean, you can, I guess the Lord has many names. Each, each of the Lord's forms also include many names concluded in that form. So we're not limiting like that. And when you say His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, his divine grace refers to the Supreme Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Hare Krishna. Okay. We got a question here. We got one question from the local devotees here we have. Four brahmacharis sitting in in the temple here listening, and we're also on the uh, Croatian Facebook, so we have another uh, cyberspace audience. I don't know how many people are out there. Uh, at, at the present, eight. We have eight Here. people there. In English and two in Croatian. Uh, so this is a question by Mohana, Mohanasini Radha Dasi. Uh, Hare Krishna Gurudev, do you know about any bona fide translation of Manu Samhita as Vaishnavas can or shall, shall we study these scriptures as well? Uh, Manu Samhita, she's asking about. Now Prabhupada didn't give us Manu Samhita because Manu Samhita is just... Yeah, someone someone asked is well, should we you know search out and study Manu Manu Samhita? The Manu Samhitas change with every Manu, so of course we're 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 in the Manu Vaibhishvata Manu right now, and so they're the law books for mankind. Manu the, the Manu Samhitas, how society should organize itself, and so. I mean, it's so detailed, these Manu Samhitas. And sometimes devotees read Manu Samhita and get confused because it seems like some of the principles in Manu Samhita will be opposed to or clash with spiritual principles. But Manu Samhita has to be understood in, in both a moral way and a practical way. It's just the law books on how people should govern their lives in such a way as that they, when they, when they organize their moral and, and what we say, life in a certain way, according to all aspects of life, how to raise the family, how to make an occupation. It's like Mano Samhita says, you know. Mano Samhita says uh, a merchant should not make more than 25% profit. So who's going to follow that? <laughs> He's allowed to make 25% profit, no more, and that way they can put that 25% back into the business and then generate. So in other words, a person can live as a businessman, but nowadays people consider business as, as much as you can make and you go ahead and do that. If you make 500% profit, then you're considered a good businessman, you know. So the rules, regulations, principles, uh, Mano Samhita, are, are not generally, but Prabhupada's giving those practical terms in many of his lectures and in, in, the, in the Bhagavad Gita, you can find a few of them, and also in Srimad Bhagavatam. So we don't need to go to the Mano Samhita directly. And Manu Samhita mostly talks in terms of Varna and Ashram. So there is activities for Brahmins, for Kshatriyas, for Vaishyas, Sudras, like that, different Ashrams. Uh, so I, I would say if whatever you can you ever, whatever you want to need to know, you can know it through Srila Prabhupada's books. Everything's there.
Okay, is there any more from the chat? If you feel like you're not doing the right way, or you're you're not offering it in a, or you're not offering it in the right mood, then you just work on that and make it better. That's all. If you have that feeling, there is some indication that maybe something didn't wasn't as up to up to the standard that it could have been. Now you just reflect on that and think, all right. I'm going to, next time I do it, I'm going to try harder. Yeah, just do your best. Sometimes devotees have that experience where they feel like they could do they could have did it much better. So next time you get a chance to do the same service, you know, do it. Do it nicer. Remember what you did last time and try to improve on it. That's all. Whatever is done is done. You can't go back and undo it, but you can learn from your experience how to improve. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're we're practically right there at the closing time. Okay, uh, I hope you continue the program. It's it's very good. I know so many people are benefiting from it. Okay, if if things are what we call quote unquote back to normal, then I'll be there. But I think there's, um, then I don't want to sound negative, but uh, we don't know what what the situation in this world is going to bring in terms of how the whole thing will play itself out. Krishna consciousness will always go on no matter what, that's for sure. Thank you. I wish thanks for, thanks to all the devotees for taking interest in in the shastras and 
and asking really good questions. Hari Bol, Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Hari Bol. When I see you, I become even more happy. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Come visit Croatia if the chance comes. <laughs> the bodies will be. <laughs> Thank you, and may may the program get better and better. Hare <laughs> Krishna. Okay.